see if I can get this rigged perfectly. Yes, I'm taping my phone to my computer. All right. Let's get this lined up. Get me lined up. How's it going, everybody? Chris Trapasso here from CBS Sports. Another episode of the Nameless Football Show. Remember, for the Nameless Football Show, ask any questions that you have. Drop them in the comments section, and I will get to your question here live on air on TikTok live on the show. I lost a little back holder thing on my phone, whatever they're called, uh, and push sock, pop socket, and I am reverting to taping my phone to my computer. We're very primitive here. We keep it real at the Nameless Football Show. That looks like it should stay. Nope. I literally am taping this like I'm 15 years old. All right. If anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments section. If you see me look down, I'm just looking at my QuickTime player to see what the question is, and I'll try to answer it. Uh, I work some trades on my team is now James Robinson, Dalvin Cook, Jamar Chase, uh, Diggs, and A.J. Brown. Sounds good to me. I got Kamara, uh, Ertz, Aaron Jones for Jamal Williams, Herbert, and J.T. Did I win? Probably, unless J.T. rebounds. Um, now, I'm not going to turn this into a fantasy football show, and a lot of times it's hard to give us a, a genuinely good answer about fantasy football because I don't know the person that you traded with, the owner, who they have, what the rest of the league looks like, where you are in the standings. So I want to get right to it. Um, I am Chris Trapasso from CBSSports.com, young player analyst, NFL draft analyst. That's probably, if you do know me, if you're not just following this live video just to watch it. If you know who I am, it's probably because of my work at CBS Sports over the last five years covering the NFL Draft. Um, before that, SB Nation as the Buffalo Rumblings editor-in-chief, Bleacher Report, freelancing on Fox Sports, freelancing for CBS. Um, so what I have for you tonight is a little sneak preview of an article that has coming that I have coming out tomorrow on cbssports.com all about Geno Smith. Geno Smith has been absolutely on fire this season and I wanted to answer the question can Geno Smith continue to be cooking with gas like he has in this first month of the season. Now I get it the last 2 weeks uh Detroit Lions Seattle or Atlanta Falcons, Detroit Lions, or in um, this past week, Detroit Lions. Not the greatest defenses in the world. But I think when you read this article, when it comes out tomorrow, you will be fascinated by what I uncovered diving into the analytics and the film with Geno Smith will probably surprise you. It surprised me. I go into any of those research based articles with an open mind, but I, I can't. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I can't lie that going into it, I think in the back portions of my brain, I thought, I don't know, Geno Smith at almost 32 years old, is he really going to have that Ryan Tannehill resurgence in Seattle on this roster with so much youth and really DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett and not much else offensively? Although Rashad Penny looks like one of the most explosive backs in the NFL. Like five years later, he looks to be... Uh, justifying the fact that he was the, one of the more surprising first-round picks over the last five to seven years. Although with the Seahawks, was he that surprising? I mean, James Carpenter, LJ Collier, Penny, one of them. Um, in the Pete Carroll and John Schneider era, the Seahawks have certainly made um, a bunch of kind of surprising picks, especially in the first round. All right, do I start Brandon Ayuk, Josh Reynolds, or George Pickens, Robert Woods, or Gabe Davis? I think those are two different questions. Uh, man, that's tough because Pickens, he got over 100 yards last week for the first time in his career. Probably the first of many times it's going to happen for George Pickens. I don't love him against the, the Buffalo secondary on the road in Kenny Pickett's first start. Brandon Ayuk, has, there's been so much hype for him. Like every year, he kind of like reminds me of the NFC Michael Pittman that every year – there are a lot of actually really smart analysts and a lot of fans and a lot of beat reporters saying, this is the year for Brandon Ayuk, he's breaking out. I haven't seen that yet, but I do think he will get the ball um, relatively frequently, or at least they'll target him, Jimmy Garoppolo will. I would maybe lean Brandon Ayuk. If you want to roll the dice, 
potentially lower floor with George Pickens, but maybe a higher ceiling because the Bills secondary is still beat up a little bit. Um, you can maybe go with George Pickens. So Geno Smith article comes out tomorrow. So a few others, uh, videos that I highlighted this week here on TikTok. And again, I'm Chris Trapasso from NFL.com or from NFL.com. No, I used to work for NFL. I'm the NFL draft analyst for CBS Sports. If you have any questions, drop them in. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you for following the next day. I'm going to post these videos every day, the day after the Nameless Football Show, which is usually on Tuesday. I got pulled off for another appearance last night. Um, so I'm, I'm running this Wednesday night from 6.45 to 7.15 Eastern. Uh, let's see. Who is the best wide receiver in the draft? Great question, and I like to kind of rehash what I've discussed on Twitter, what I've written about at CBS Sports, and what I've posted on TikTok. And I sent out a tweet that surprisingly got a lot of traffic this week, a lot of traction, that I tweeted, and this is paraphrasing my own tweet, but that it was something along the lines of what seems like the last 50 drafts we've had a great wide receiver class, and really that meant like the last four or five. But after that, I, I don't think right now the 2023 draft class looks very good at wide receiver. Now, it feels like, how can that be? Every team is rolling out three and four wides or just so many more quality athletes playing the receiver position. And while I think that's mostly true, and over the course of a 10 or a 15 or a 20-year stretch, you're going to get way more high-end receiver classes than not. But Keishon Boutte from LSU, disappointing beginning of the season. Is there any maturity and character issues there? Hasn't been super productive and hasn't played a ton. Jackson Smith and the Jigba, who I, I was high on. I, I didn't think he was in that even Garrett Wilson range or Jamar Chase, you know, top five wide receiver, Jalen Waddell, top 10 receiver um, range because I don't think he's a crazy athlete. He gets injured against Notre Dame in the first game of the season. So we've barely seen him. Jordan Addison's been good. We haven't seen a ton of him, though, being on the East Coast and him playing at USC. He's a little smaller. Josh Downs has been banged up. Quinton Johnson, Quinton Johnston from TCU has been eh, hit or miss. I think uh, Rishi Rice from SMU, who's actually playing tonight, is on the rise. There's some risers, but after a few drafts in a row of like top 10 caliber wide receivers, a lot of the guys that were hyped up, most, most notably... Jackson Smith, the Jigba, and Kayshawn Boutte from LSU have just not either not played or they haven't lived up to the hype earlier this season. Um, okay, so I'm going to, again, scroll past most of the fantasy football questions because for as much as I, I do want to answer all, all your questions, this is not a fantasy football show. Um, I want to talk about a few of the other TikToks I sent out this week. Um, staying on the NFL draft front, does anyone else think – that Alabama's Jameer Gibbs could actually push B. Jan Robinson from Texas to be the consensus RB1 in the 2023 draft. Now, maybe consensus is strong because I, I think a lot of people have already kind of made up their minds with B. Jan Robinson, and I was smitten while watching him over the summer. I thought if there was a running back that could sneak into the first round, it would be him, although I am a major not non-advocate for a wide receiver go or a running back going in the first round, but he's big. The cutting ability was explosive. Stop and start acceleration caught the ball well. Jameer Gibbs currently leads Alabama in receptions, and he is faster, I think, than Bijan Robinson in a straight line down the football field. He kind of fits the mold more of what it feels like teams want NFL teams. For the pro level, that Bijan Robinson is your Najee Harris esque feature back, and Najee Harris was a first round pick. Jameer Gibbs is more Travis Etienne, but he's more explosive, and I think he's a better runner and can hit bigger plays. Certainly, Travis Etienne hit a lot of big plays in his illustrious career at Clemson. But in just watching the film and seeing how Jameer Gibbs has quickly transitioned from Georgia Tech to the Crimson Tide, when you factor in physical ability, athleticism, 40-yard dash time, I don't think he'll be the consensus 
running back one in this draft class that probably the majority of people will still have that as Bijan Robinson. But Jameer Gibbs is not out of the question for some people, including myself. I haven't obviously made a determination yet this early in the football season. Jameer Gibbs will be in the conversation to be the RB1 because he is crazy explosive. He changes directions without even slowing down a lot of the times. And for being a little bit smaller... He has great contact balance, can really power through contact, keep those legs churning, and pick up extra yards. Talk about Baltimore. All right, I will. Uh, the Here's where I stand on what happened on the fourth down late in that game. In general, in almost every situation, really, I am a proponent of teams being aggressive. And actually watching that game live, when the Bills got the stop on third down, I said, this is going to be a situation where the Ravens go for it on fourth down. I just knew the makeup of John Harbaugh's staff, the big analytics department that Baltimore has had for multiple seasons now. They're going to go for it. And initially, because I'm mostly on the decision, or I side with the decision of going for it, I thought, all right, yeah, this is the right choice. And then I realized four minutes to go, tie game in the rain, That felt like a situation to me where if I was John Harbaugh, I would have kicked a field goal. I I would have gotten the lead. Now, that's not the same as early in a game. If you're on the one-yard line, you just take the lead because you have the rest of the game for a million different things to transpire. Now, Josh Allen was really, really good from the second quarter through the end of that contest. But there were a couple times where balls were almost intercepted. There was almost a fumble late in that game in the second-to-last Play from scrimmage, Devin Singletary almost fumbled. He had a fumble. There was a bunch of drops. Saying all that because had the Ravens kicked that field goal, the Bills would have have, had to drive probably 75 yards in four minutes all the way down the field and score a touchdown with no balls popping out, no tipped pass off You know the, the wet gloves of a wide receiver to win the game. And the Ravens would have said, oh, okay, well, even if – you don't score a touchdown, your kicker is going to have to make a pressure kick down three to tie the game. So in that situation, I think the Ravens should have kicked the field goal. I understand that it went about as poorly as it could have gone for Baltimore with Jordan Poyer intercepting the Lamar Jackson pass so the Bills didn't have to go like 98 yards to score the touchdown or to kick the field goal. My tape's falling a little bit here. Um, But I still, in that situation, late in a game, I think it makes sense to get the points, take the lead, and have the lead and put the pressure on the other team. Now, I I get it that the the Ravens secondary has not been fantastic this season. I don't think they were dreadful in that game. That was probably one of their better performances, although, like I said, Josh Allen really moved the ball however he wanted in the second half. Um, but I still would have taken the points. And I think I think they'll be okay. The one thing that I will say, which might uh, not ruffle some feathers, but be kind of contradictory to or, or um, against kind of the, the mold of what the narrative has been for this player, I think Lamar Jackson deserves a huge contract. The, the fact that Patrick Mahomes has one, that Justin Herbert is soon to get one, that uh, Josh Allen has one, Kyler Murray, Patrick Mahomes, all those – All those relatively young, a small group of people, some more prominent figures than others that thought he should move to receiver, that thought he was a terrible passer and only a runner. And it almost feels like during Lamar Jackson's career, when he has had good games or had the MVP season in 2019, it was, there was so much emphasis put on what he accomplished that to almost get back at a lot of those critics before he even stepped into the NFL. And now, as a way to defend Lamar Jackson for all of time, it's almost uh, met with its own criticism if you say, hey, you know what? He does miss some throws that the elite quarterbacks typically don't miss. And I don't think he has got any problem in crunch time, but you go back to the Dolphins' loss. There was three or four throws in that fourth quarter that could have put that game away and not allowed the Dolphins to come back, but Lamar Jackson missed a couple of those throws. He is the most dynamic running quarterback we've ever seen, more dynamic than Michael Vick. Uh, he's a different runner than Josh Allen or Cam Newton. but And I think he is a better passer than what those pre-draft critics 
thought he was in 2018. He was coming from Bobby Petrino's offense, and Bobby Petrino was a former NFL coach. It was actually pro or, or pretty much a, a pro style system um, that Lamar Jackson operated very well. He was a good inside the pocket passer. Now, since he's been in the NFL, do I think he has grown significantly as a passer like we've seen Patrick Mahomes and like we've seen Josh Allen do? I I don't think so. I think Lamar Jackson is a good to very good pocket passer and in terms of accuracy and reading coverage and diagnosing the leverage of a corner and deciding where he needs to go with the football, I don't think he's on the level of Patrick Mahomes, of Josh Allen, of even Justin Herbert, um, and to a certain degree, Joe Burrow. So I think that is probably why the Ravens have not offered him a deal that he feels is worth what he should get on the open market. And the Ravens, certainly there's every team has a history of not paying their star players what they ultimately believe they should get. But I think there's a reason for that. It feels like John Harbaugh and Eric DaCosta, the GM, they're, they're all in on Lamar Jackson. They're not trying to not have him be their quarterback. But I don't think that they want to necessarily tie more money up in him than what the Packers have in Aaron Rodgers or the Chiefs in Patrick Mahomes or the Bills in Josh Allen. Now, I do think the Ravens eventually can win a Super Bowl with Lamar Jackson. And really, that's the central question. Do you have a quarterback that you believe you can win a Super Bowl with? And I think the the answer to that is definitively yes. But just because Lamar Jackson will be the last in line to get the contract, yes, he, based on precedent, he should maybe get the biggest deal. But if we're just looking at where he is as a passer compared to the other top-tier young quarterbacks in the NFL, I just think he's a clear step behind them as a passer. Now, maybe you can say he counters that because he's the best runner in the NFL, designed runner, scrambler, and he does crazy things um, with his legs, with his improvisation. But I think there's so much defense, even among the players and a lot of the media, because they felt the need to do that after the ridiculous criticism heading into the draft from a small collection of people that thought he should be a receiver or a running back or he wasn't a first-round caliber quarterback prospect because he actually was better than what a lot of those critics believe. So it's kind of a gray area, in my opinion, with Lamar Jackson. I would pay him if I were the Ravens. Would I pay him exorbitantly more than what, again, what the, the Bills gave Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes? Probably not. I would maybe go in that neighborhood And I'm just in this rant realizing that the Deshaun Watson deal probably throws a wrench in all of this. Had Lamar, had Deshaun Watson not signed for $230 million fully guaranteed, then I don't think we would be talking about this because this deal would probably already be done. All right. How do you think he will fit in with the Falcons? I don't know. Brother Bando, let me know who you're talking about. I was on that rant there. I was rolling for a little bit. Um, If you're talking about Lamar Jackson, I don't... I mean, the opportunities, the options for Lamar Jackson, uh, I think if he were on the open market, they would be pretty big. But I I don't think the Ravens are just going to let him walk. I think franchise tag, offer him a a differently structured deal, I could see them doing that. Um, But I don't think they're going to just let Lamar Jackson walk if, if he... But I do think Lamar Jackson is a man of precedent. And I think he would say, hey, you know what? I'm not taking a franchise deal. I don't want to play on the franchise tag for one year. I want a, a contract that is a lot or in line with some of the other top quarterbacks in the NFL. But just in general, as an analyst, I don't think he's in that absolute elite tier as a passer. And I do certainly factor in that his running ability does kind of raise him up. Maybe he's the 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 eighth to twelfth best passer, but he's the best runner. So that's really the difficult spot that I think the Ravens and a lot of analysts have with Lamar Jackson, because it's clear to me that he's not in that elite tier passing wise, but he is absolutely the best runner in the NFL. Let's see thoughts on Jalen Carter. I'm a huge fan. I know he's been banged up a little bit this season. Um, And in doing mock drafts every week for CBS sports, I have one actually a new one out today. So you can go check that out. Every Wednesday I have a new mock draft. All season, leading all the way up to the NFL draft in late April. Um, What's good about doing mock drafts this early is you get a sense of the strengths 
of a class positionally and the teams that need certain positions. Like to me, there's still three or four teams near the top of the draft or teams that are likely to pick there that need receiver. And like I mentioned, I don't know if I'm picking any receiver like inside the top 10. So that's going to push up defensive linemen like Jalen Carter, who's a very disruptive, uh, physical, athletic length is certainly there. Good run stopper, gets upfield, I think better than any of the other Georgia defensive linemen in last year's draft. And we had two first rounders in Jordan Davis and Devontae Wyatt. Um, you have him, you have Miles Murphy from Clemson, Brian Breesey from Clemson. Um, there's a lot of front seven pieces on defense that I think will be pushed up the board. The offensive line position usually takes some time to kind of formulate. Um, the quarterbacks, I think, will be a hot topic. But I, I don't know if there's a lot of wide receivers that will go that early. So I think Jalen Carter and company, the top of the defensive tackle class, should go maybe earlier than they would in previous drafts over the last five to seven years where teams are realizing like, hey, we need we need offense. We need receivers. We need quarterbacks. We need tight ends. We got Kyle Pitts going in the top five. I don't know if that will be the case because it looks as though the receiver class is a little bit weaker. Offensive tackle might be a little bit weaker after a good five to seven year run with a bunch of uh, first round tackles and blockers going early in the draft. Early thoughts on Evan Neal. Okay, so against the Cowboys and Demarcus Lawrence, rough. Other than that, I think he's held his own pretty well. I think with Evan Neal, he was so physically overwhelming in college that he could just win on sheer size and power alone. And that welcome to the NFL game against Demarcus Lawrence probably was a, a reality check for him. It, it certainly was that he's even though he is gigantic, he's 6'7", 340, you're not just going to win with your size alone. Now, I don't think he's got bad balance or his, his kick slide is bad or his pass protection is bad, but that was an area I thought all those areas he had to work on a little bit um, when entering the NFL. And I think facing Micah Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence, a lot of quality rushers, the Cincinnati defensive ends that are pretty good, they're very refined, will help him later in the season. His run blocking, unsurprisingly, has been very good. And I think it's been a big reason he and Andrew Thomas, why Saquon Barkley is fully back. He is all the way back and he is like Penn State Saquon Barkley. Again, it's a lot of fun. All right, um, is the 2023 draft an RB draft? I think it's pretty good at running back. Those two, Jameer Gibbs and Bijan Robinson, Zach Evans from Ole Miss, uh, it, I think it will be a quality running back class. It feels like always late in the process, too. There's a guy that played on a 500 team that you just see jumps off the film that didn't get a lot of publicity uh, during the pre-draft process. The running backs and tight ends are good. And I think the tight ends could also could be awesome with Darnell Washington, Michael Mayer. Um, Eric Gilbert's had a little maybe off-the-field issues there at Georgia. But um, there, Cade Stover from Ohio State. The Oregon State tight end, his name is escaping me right now. It's a good, a much better tight end class that we've had um, in terms of depth. I mean, we certainly had Kyle Pitts, who was a unicorn. But two of the last three draft classes at tight end did not really have the depth, like the, the round two, round three guys that seem to be instant contributors. But I think we'll have that in 2023. Um, start Hines since JT is out. Absolutely. I mean, they're going to still want to run the football, Indianapolis Colts. Like, that's their philosophy that's their identity I think with just the lack of skill position players I mean everyone's been waiting for Michael Pittman to become this superstar I never saw it with him I mean I didn't think he was a bad prospect coming out of USC but I never saw him as someone that could be this alpha wide receiver one you have Alec Pierce back um, another big athletic specimen we know Chris Ballard loves the big time athletes um, I still think though even with JT out start Naheem Hines even if he doesn't have a Jonathan Taylor game on the ground. Matt Ryan's going to throw him the football. You're going to get 7 to 10 cheap points um, just from him catching passes out of the backfield. Why do no quarterbacks excite me in the 2023 draft class? This is for my boy Kevin Boylard, who's the man. Um, what am I missing? Kevin, great question, and I'll finish with this because I like to finish up right around 7.15. Maybe one more question after this. Okay, so Bryce Young, you're probably not excited about him, maybe relative to the masses, because he's small. He's not just someone that would that would fall into all the criticism or the um, controversy that, say, Baker Mayfield or Kyler Murray or, or Russell Wilson fell into. They were all around six foot, but they all had sturdy frames. 
Bryce Young is built almost like a nickel corner, like a taller nickel corner. He's probably 5'11", maybe six foot, lanky. He has the shoulder injury now. He's certainly in terms of poise, anticipation, accuracy, um, I think borderline elite. Like he is up there as, you know, someone that would be in the mix with a lot of the other first round quarterbacks that have been selected over the past couple of years, but he's small and he does like to run around a lot. Now, I don't have any data about the history of smaller quarterbacks getting injured in the NFL, but it's just going to be a lot harder for a team to get behind not only a six foot quarterback, but a six foot sub 200 pound quarterback that has a good arm, not a great arm, and he's more about accuracy and poise and confidence than anything else. C.J. Stroud, Kevin, I think you should be excited about him because he's big, he's a great pocket passer, elite pocket passer, quality arm, but if you're not crazy excited, it's because the improvisation box, athleticism box, is probably not ticked with him. Now, in college, in the Big Ten, of course, not the craziest group of athletes, C.J. Stroud can get around. He can pick up a third and six if all of his receivers are covered, and they're they're rarely covered there at Ohio State. In the NFL, he kind of feels similar to Joe Burrow in that range in terms of athleticism. He can move in the pocket. He's going to make a lot of high-impact throws from the pocket, but we love that improvisation ability. Everyone's chasing the Justin Herbert and the Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. He doesn't really tick that box. Will Levis, I think on film, Looks like a classic high first round pick at the quarterback spot, but he's really old. He's like 24 years old when he enters the NFL. Now, Kenny Pickett was 24 years old and the Steelers picked him in the first round last year, but will Will Levis be able to pass a lot of those thresholds, age thresholds for a lot of teams picking maybe inside the top 10 where you're getting a quarterback who's 24, 25 years old during their first two seasons in the NFL when other guys like Jameis Winston was 21 years old entering the NFL. Josh Allen was 22, like things like that. Even Baker Mayfield was an older older prospect, and he was only 23 when he entered the NFL. Anthony Richardson has Josh Allen-esque ability. He has all pro upside, but we've saw but we've seen over the past couple of weeks that he's raw. He's only a redshirt sophomore. It's not going to be a shocker if Anthony Richardson decides to return to Florida and actually enter in the 2024 draft class. Early on, the game against Utah, he showed it all. The arm talent, the improvisation, the designed running ability. So I can understand why people would say, hey, you know what? I, I want to aim for the Josh Allen in the draft, but I don't know if Anthony Richardson is even to the level of polish that Josh Allen was after he entered the NFL in 2018, that he had multiple seasons as a full-time starter at Wyoming, was certainly raw, but Anthony Richardson may actually be more raw in terms of reading coverage, footwork, making quality decisions on a consistent basis. So Kevin, that is probably why you are a little bit lower on this draft class. I think there's more to be excited about this draft class than last year's because you have those bigger specimens, multiple year starters that have been productive um, at the blue blood programs like Alabama and Ohio State, Florida, Kentucky is not a blue blood football program, but they've been good under, um, I want to say Bob Stoops. I'm totally forgetting what his name is, um, which is bad that I'm totally forgetting that. Mark Stoops. It's a better quarterback class in general. Devin Leary had a big season last year. The big-time throws haven't really been there. The two names that I'll throw out, and I've written about them at CBS Sports, Kevin, if you want to look at them, look more into them. Michael Penix, Washington, transferred from Indiana and has been almost lights out for all but about two quarters, two or three quarters this season. Big arm, lefty, um, athletic, loves to push the ball down the field, great touch down the field. And DJ Uwe Ungalale from Clemson. Everyone knows him. He was the heir apparent to Trevor Lawrence, like the biggest recruit in the nation a couple years ago. And if you watch any Clemson game, you'll hear the commentator say he lost 30 pounds in the offseason, which you can certainly see he's a lot more sleek. He's been way better as a pocket passer. And I actually tweeted during the Clemson NC State game over the weekend, two top 10 teams battling it out. And Clemson came out the winner in that game that whenever DJ Uwe Ungalale enters the NFL, and he could certainly stay until 2024 or the 2024 draft, he will be in the top five or six quarterbacks in terms of just physical ability because he's about 6'4", 6'5", lost 30 pounds. He's still like 225, 230, 
twitchy athlete, explosive athlete, and has a monster arm. So I think DJ Uwe Ungele, if he continues to play as well and as sharply as he has over the first month and a half for Clemson, he could hear a lot of draft buzz about himself, read a lot of draft buzz about himself, and enter the draft. He would be someone more on that Josh Allen type of road where you don't you're not going to love starting him week one, but maybe by year or week eight in his second season you'll really have something. All right, uh, that'll do it for me today. If anyone has any questions, are the Steelers a better team with Kenny Pickett at QB? Absolutely. They were not going to do anything different offensively with Mitchell Trubisky at quarterback than what they did last year, the first season under offensive coordinator Matt Canada during Ben Roethlisberger's final season where his arm was pretty much not there anymore. They were going to dink and dunk. They're still going to do that with Kenny Pickett. Probably on Sunday you'll see a lot of quick passing to get the ball out of his hand so they're not dealing with the pass, so he's not dealing with the Bills' pass rush too frequently. But Kenny Pickett will push the ball down the field. He'll be aggressive. Um, that was, the to me, the one area that was always lacking with Mitchell Trubisky, the confidence, the assertiveness as a passer to throw the football down the field. And maybe he had that a little bit in that one season at North Carolina. But once he made some mistakes in Chicago, I don't think he ever got that confidence back. And Kenny Pickett, I mean, yes, he threw three interceptions, one being on a Hail Mary in his first appearance in the NFL. But I think he'll be a lot more accurate and more confident at the intermediate level and down the field. Maybe the decision-making will take some time and he may not deal with pressure as well as Mitchell Trubisky did. But in general, I think the Steelers are much better off with Kenny Pickett, who, yes, he's a rookie, but he's started a ton of football. He's ready to play, um, maybe not at a high level in the NFL, but in terms of reading coverages, understanding where he needs to go with the football, in general, I think he's ready to play, and the Steelers' offense is will be much better, um, in, especially long-term. It'll be better with Kenny Pickett in the shotgun under center than with Mitchell than with Mitchell Trubisky. All right, uh, that'll do it for me tonight. I'm Chris Trapasso. Thank you so much for watching the Nameless Football Show. Oh, I got to try to end this. Okay, there we go.